Nadia, having learned some of the lessons or just kind of learned the tastes of the judges or how to navigate this highly political process, uh, gives Lily some advice. And that advice was to, to cultivate this idea of the femme fragile. And you can read here what Fauster notes, but Lily Boulanger's embodiment of the femme fragile constituted a carefully constructed role in which she took on the unthreatening aspect of the eternal female who needed the support and help of the strong masculine sex. There is no doubt that she won her pre uh, pre because of her musical achievement. The cantata is an outstanding contribution to the genre. But she also received the premier Grand Prix because she succeeded in conforming to a popular concept of feminin femininity. So not only did Lily have to write the most superior composition by far, not only did she have to appeal to the musical tastes of the judges, but she had to cultivate this very particular, very specific personality that wouldn't threaten the judges. Right, things that obviously her male counterparts never had to even imagine worrying about. And it's this savvy, this political savvy that Nadia and Lily cultivate um, in addition to Lily's talents as an unbelievable composer that lead to Lily winning the Prix de Rome. This is just, I referenced some of the letters back and forth. This just shows you the humor of Lily Boulanger, despite someone who um, has to overcome these serious, um, the obstacles of health, the obstacles of living in a, a very sexist society. She still was most times very upbeat and very humorous. This is uh, to Nadia, written to Nadia, and what was going on was Lily was trying to finish this cantata for the Prix de Rome, but she wanted to orchestrate some of it. She would write it out, you know, compose it on piano, and then she would orchestrate some, and then would go back to composing some on piano. And her teacher said, listen, don't worry about the orchestration. You can figure that out later. I just want you to finish it. Finish it, write it out, go back and orchestrate it later. That's not what she wanted to do. So she wrote to Nadia about it. The poor man, he's going to make himself sick over this. And me, I'm cruel. I'm bowled over in laughter. In fact, I'm not worried about the composition having only some transitions and to finish the third scene. And yet I was and will be very annoyed at the idea of returning to composition because I prefer orchestrating a little. And when I am calmer, I will finish the transitions, which will only take me a few hours. Right? So it's just evidence, this window into how much um, Nadia meant to her and that close relationship where she would confide in Nadia things that she wouldn't in uh, her own teachers, which I found was interesting. Okay, time for the good part. We actually get to listen to some music. Um, I want to play for you a little bit of Faust and Helen. This is the cantata that she won the Prix de Rome with. Uh, I think it's absolutely stunning music. Uh, it's at times uh, sounds to me very much like Faure, sometimes like Debussy, sometimes like Mahler. Um, what you're going to hear is the uh, orchestra and then two vocal soloists. There are three in this um, work, but you're just going to hear the tenor and the, and the baritone today. So just take a listen. This is going to run for a couple minutes. I just want you to listen to her beautiful music. I think. Ah. There we go.
Isn't that beautiful music? I mean, just unbelievable uh, vocal writing, the, the, the harmony, the orchestration. Um, I could listen to that music all day. It, it, no, no, duh, she won the Prix de Rome, right? Like, amazing, amazing talent. After winning uh, the Prix de Rome, unsurprisingly, catapulted into stardom across um, Europe. Um, and she went to go study in Rome, as was part of her prize. Um, sadly, her time in Rome, though, was cut short for two reasons. Um, the first was the outset of World War I. She won in 1913. Um, so the, uh, her time in Rome butted up against the beginning of World War I. A and more importantly for her, her health continued to worsen. She, be able sh she became able to do less and less. Her bad days became more frequent. Her good days became more infrequent. Um, to the point where she was really almost bedridden by um, the time that she left Rome. Uh, after the Prix de Rome, her output consists of uh, many works for voice, either solo or for uh, choir or duets, uh, and then a lot of chamber music as well for smaller instrumental ensembles. Um, and uh, you're going to hear some of her later music in a second, but one of the amazing things uh, is that her music changes over this very short period of time. and, and it goes from this beautiful, lush, uh, impressionistic sound that you just heard um, to stuff that's a little bit more biting and a little bit um, uh, has more grit to it, uh, which I find incredible to have such range over a short period of time. Um, eventually, her uh, health continues to decline, and uh, she dies on March 15, 1918, at the age of only 24 years old. She wrote that cantata when she was 19, right? I forget what I was doing when I was 19, but it was not making music on that level. Uh, and, and to die at only 24, you know, what a talent, what could have been had she lived longer, you know, just even 10, 20, 30 years longer, if she had enjoyed a full long life. Uh, I'm convinced she would have been a household name um, in, in the classical world of composition, for sure. So I, I want to spend the rest of the time talking today a little bit about two of her later works, um, and they're actually two of just a handful of works that are written for large instrumental ensembles. Uh, now, both of these works, um, Du matin de printemps, which means of a spring morning, I apologize for my French, by the way, and Du soir tri, which means of a sad evening, uh, both of them were written for full orchestra, kind of, uh, 1917, 1918, and there's really not much written about how these two particular pieces came about. We don't know much about them. We know when they were written. We kind of have an insight into the intention of these two pieces, but we really don't know much. They were conceived of as chamber works before they were conceived as large orchestral works. Uh, of a Spring Morning actually exists in multiple chamber forms, and we know for a fact existed in those forms before Lily decided to go ahead and orchestrate Of a Spring Morning for symphony orchestra. Of a Sad Afternoon is a little bit more vague. There is some indication that while there are chamber versions of this piece, that she conceived of the chamber version and the full orchestra version at the same time. We don't know which one came first. They were intended as partner pieces, we think. If you take a look at the ma uh, main melodic material, and these excerpts are from her handwritten score, you can see that there are some similarities between those two melodies, right? These are the main melodies in each piece of A Spring Morning on top, of a sad afternoon, afternoon on the bottom. And just look at the shape of the melody. We get this, uh, this interval of a rising third, returning back to its original tone, followed by a neighbor tone below it. Right? And then that melody then rises up in a scalar passage. So the melodic material to these two pieces is very, very similar, hinting to us that they were intended to be performed as partner pieces. That's really where the similarities between the two pieces end, though. They're both incredibly different in mood, character, style, tempo. Of a Spring Morning is, is bubbly and energetic, whereas A Sad Afternoon is much more broody and uh, introverted and um, uh, conveys a sense of anguish. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. During her... Uh, during this time in her life, it was actually, these were two of the last three pieces that she wrote, and I was just talking with Dr. Osuga. She's going to be singing the last piece that Lily Boulanger wrote. It was actually um, a piece that she wrote when she was on her deathbed. She was too weak to write out the piece, so Nadia had to transcribe it for her. Um, so these pieces were, were 
composed right at the end of her life, and we see uh, a lot of errors and revisions in these scores, and kind of makes us wonder what she really wanted. She certainly did not hear these pieces performed in the full orchestra setting in her lifetime, which is uh, an important tidbit that I'm going to talk about uh, again in a little bit. So I came across of a spring morning um, in the fall of 2020 by chance. I was doing a project for school, and I had uh, just YouTube up in the background listening to something, um, and it, the browser wasn't open. I think it was a Word document or something like that. And that piece ended, and then you know YouTube automatically suggests a new piece for you to listen to. And uh, it slipped into the Seattle Symphony's performance of, of a spring morning. And I, it was maybe running for a couple of minutes, and I didn't really know what it was, but I was listening. I was like, this is awesome. What is this? And I looked at it, and I was like, oh, okay, wow. I've never heard of Lily Boulanger. Is she related to Nadia Boulanger? Yeah, okay. Well, that's pretty cool. Oh, she died when she was 24. That's tragic. This music is awesome, though. Uh, and I thought it would work really, really well as a wind ensemble piece because it used a lot of wind instruments. There were a lot of wind instrument solos. There wasn't a ton of string idiomatic writing. And uh, it's very common in the band world, if, if you're not familiar with it these days, to find pieces from other mediums that we think might work as a band piece and then arrange them. The term is transcribe if you're not changing any pitches or rhythms, if you're staying really true to that original score. And not a transcription in the jazz sense um, where you're listening to something and writing it down but really arranged these two these pieces for wind ensemble. And I said, okay, well, this would be really cool. And I, I put the link in an email, and I sent it to my professor, and this was in October, I think. And uh, he said, yeah, this is really cool, awesome. Didn't think about it again for another six months. Uh, May 2021 rolls around, and we're sitting in my professor's office, and we're planning out the concert season for the next year. And he said, okay, well, we're going to play this, we're going to play this, we're going to play this on the first concert. And the second concert, well, we're just going to open, Jack, you're going to transcribe of a spring morning, and we're going to open with that. And I said, what? <laughs> I, well, I'm doing what now? He said, yeah, you're just going to do that. I said, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to do that. Uh, it wasn't posed as a question. It was posed as a, you're going to make this happen. And so that's really how this process began for me. And I settled over the course of the summer transcribing of a spring morning. Um, fell in love with Lily Boulanger's music. Came across of a sad afternoon. Learned that they were partner pieces. And uh, the transcription of a, sa of, Avis of, of a sad afternoon wound up being my doctoral project. I want to talk a little bit about this process of, of the transcription or arrangement process because I, this is by no means the process that everyone has to follow, but it's something that worked really, really well for me. So it starts with an organic beginning if you're interested in doing something like this. Find a piece that you have a connection with. right? Don't go out and just try to find a piece that you don't really like or that you, you really like but you don't think it will work. You know, Find music that you're passionate about and interested in and make that the center of a project like this. That's what happened for me, this organic, spontaneous beginning that I was very lucky to kind of walk into. After that, when, uh, when I, for both of these pieces, I, I set about going ahead and analyzing them, trying to understand as much as I could about the piece because that would help me in my transcription process. When I was done analyzing and I, I felt like I had my brain wrapped around these pieces, I went ahead and I, I started taking notes on scores, just jotting down ideas. I'm like, oh, this... This line we can keep exactly the same. This this brass writing is great. We're going to just copy and paste that. And this section here, maybe this cello line, maybe I could put that in euphonium. Or what it, maybe a bassoon would be better. Okay, all right. Well, what about this passage in the violins? How can I, like, can you put that in the mallet percussion? Will that kind of keep it really subtle and, and light and bouncy? All right, so I just went through and I just scribbled down notes. And when I was done with that, I said in transcribing, my first rule was to retain all the original material wherever possible. So if there were wind solos and things like that that I could just copy and paste, Go ahead and do that. A, it's m much easier to do it that way, and B, it allows for us to keep an intent, a r the intent of the score, the original score, true, right? We want to keep as much of, of the composer's original music intact as possible. After you've done that, I went ahead and I reassigned all of the music that needed to be reassigned. So obviously, wind ensemble doesn't have a section of strings, so how are you going to deal with the string music? How can you reassign that in a way that um, keeps those colors and those functions as close to as what Lily would have wanted as possible. And there, uh, throughout, there was this idea of how do you stay true to the original score while making this work in your own context, right? So there would be instances, like for instance, this um, opening melody that you see in the flute of, of a spring morning. I just, because of where it was in the register of a flute, that's really soft. I didn't think it would be able to be heard um, if the running eighth note accompaniment was in a, a 
host of clarinets and mallet percussion because they just can't play as softly as a bunch of strings can, right? Strings can play super soft and super delicate. Winds don't necessarily have that ability. So in my transcription, what was originally a flute solo there is now a saxophone solo. It works a little bit better for that medium. Is it what Lily would have wanted? I have no idea, probably not. But it works well, which I think is really, really important. Because if it doesn't work well, even if it's what the composer would have wanted, um, it's just not going to get played as much because it just doesn't work. All right, so navigating those lines of how do you make this work versus how do you stay true to the composer's intent was a battle that I struggled with the entire time. And also, especially with Of a Sad Afternoon, she was dying when she wrote this. She knew that she was dying when she wrote this. And this piece was very much an outpouring of her confronting her own mortality, which gives it a lot of emotional gravitas. But there were also a ton of errors and revisions, things that were scribbled into her score that were difficult to try and make sense of. If you can see here this first example, uh, the top example there is from the horn part. And you can see that the first and the third horns have these sustains that they're trading off. But then in a different hand written underneath it, is the melody that's being played by uh, the cello section at that point in time. Did she want for the horns to play that mel melody as well? Was this something that she just thought about and then erased? Or was this something that Nadia added later? All right, that is a huge question. But it's also an insight. Because now I, when I'm going ahead and transcribing this, I can see that at some point either Nadia or Lily conceived of this melody in the French horn in addition to the cellos. Well, great, I can put this melody in the French horn now. They exist in the wind ensemble. That's great. So uh, there were clues like that in addition to challenges. You can see again the other example below it. There's a passage for the horns where those sustains have been scribbled out. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there's another set of notes that have been written over top of that. So going ahead and, and making those decisions was a pretty lengthy uh, process. But what really helped was this next part, the ability to read this through with the Wind Ensemble at University of Miami, to revise it and to revise it and to revise it, constantly editing things to make them sound better and make them work better. We performed the piece, but that's not even where the revision stopped. After we performed, I still made revisions to both of these pieces. And that was really one of the most important parts of the transcription process. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. I have here somewhere, where is it? Oh, here it is. I have here some of the uh, comparisons of the original score that I had for Of a Spring Morning and then the final score that winds up happening. And I just want to show you some of this. Bless you. Here's one of the original scores. And look how dense it is. Look how many people are playing All right, at any given point in time. This is what it winds up looking like. I found that I was over-orchestrating everything, doubling things that didn't need to be doubled, tripling things that didn't need to be tripled. and wound up revising and condensing a lot of this music, right? I promise you that this sounds way different than this, right? Here's another example. Look how many people are playing. This is at one of the big spots in Of a Spring Morning, right? Here's the converse. Right, much, much thinner, more people out of the texture, uh, less doubling, less cluttering of the music. Here's a great example as well. This is at a recap in the piece. You see there's this melody here in the upper woodlands, flutes, uh, piccolo. You can see there's this eighth note running accompaniment in the clarinets and alto saxes. And then that melody is doubled again in the trumpet section with an accompaniment in the trombones and tuba. Here's how it looks now. The flutes are still playing the melody. No clarinet and saxophone parts. No brass parts. All that mallet stuff uh, now playing those eighth notes that were running. So that's just a little bit of a, of a window into how much editing went into these and revising after we had rehearsed. If you think that you finish it and you're done, you're not. I promise you. There are always revisions to make, always things to tweak. I think most composers will tell you that that's a huge part of the process. Now, uh, talking more about uh, Dune Soir Triste, the second piece she wrote, uh, there were also instances where I followed what she had on paper, but I don't think that's really what she wanted or what she would have preferred. Remember, she never heard this performed in her lifetime, so she didn't have the ability to edit and revise. Some of that burden was put on myself. Um, this is a perfect example here. So this is the horn section, and you can see they're split into four voices. And look down here at the bottom. This is in bass clef, and this is not concert pitch. This is uh, written pitch, 
So that bottom horn would actually be sounding a fifth lower than what you see written here. That's ridiculous. That's like tuba range. Like, the horns don't play down there. I said, okay, well, that can't be right. Yeah, she didn't mean that. Maybe she's using old notation, which instead of writing the horn part a fifth above the, written, the sounding pitch, maybe she wrote it a fourth below instead. And that's kind of what I wound up with here in this version, except that bottom horn part was still too low. I had to voice it in the euphonium. And as you're going to hear, it just doesn't sound right. But that's what I thought she wanted. That's what she wrote. Well, after deciding and talking, I was like, all right, listen, it doesn't work like this. I have to change it. I bumped up the bottom horn part by a whole octave, and I revoiced the structure, and it sounds so much better. It works. Right? But because she never got to hear this performed live, she never had that insight. So I'm going to play you each of these versions. First is the orchestral version. Now, the orchestral version sounds great. It's not what's written. I promise you that. The second version is what we went with within our, in our premiere performance of it. It doesn't sound good, as you're going to hear. And then the final version is what we went with in a, a subsequent performance after I had made some of the revisions. So here are the three back to back. Sorry, I think this is the first one. Yes, this is the orchestra version. And if you're saying to yourself, I didn't hear a voice at the bottom of the bass clef there, you're right. I don't hear it either, right? So I, I, someone also made this decision when they were playing the orchestral version. Here's what it would sound like written the way that she has written it. quite sure if that's what she would have wanted if she had, had the, the opportunity to hear this live. Here's what it wound up uh, being like after we bumped that bottom line up an octave and revoiced it. So just one of those, uh, just a, a small example of, of some of the decisions that you have to make. I've got two more as well. Here's another spot. And you can see what's going on here. We have a solo line here in the cello that gets passed to a, uh, or sorry, in the violin that gets passed to a cello. You've got this accompaniment. You've got this celeste and harp of uh, arpeggio that keeps rising. And you have this rising pizzicato scale in the viola. So just take a listen to this section and think about why this might be difficult to transcribe for a wind ensemble. So why would that prove challenging to transcribe for a band? Absolutely, it's much harder to get a blended, quiet background sound that's out of the way with wind instruments than it is with string instruments. They have this amazing ability to play so softly and so delicately that wind instruments struggle with. What else? What are the what are the uh, violas doing? Aaron? Yeah, you're going to hear a very awkward breath spot when we when I play the band <laughs> version in a second. Good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What is the what are the violas doing? What technique are they using? Tremolo. No, not not tremolo. Pizzicato. Yeah, anyone know a band instrument that can play pizzicato? Let me know if you ever find one out. All right, that would be like super awesome. Obviously, wind instruments. Right. Yeah, wind instruments can't play pizzicato. 
So how do you navigate that? How do you, how do you get that sound into the band? Well, this is what I wound up with. The closest thing in a band you can get to a plucked string is a harp, in my opinion. So I took that pizzicato line and I put it in the harp. The harp was just playing, doubling the celeste, playing those arpeggi, rising arpeggiated lines. So now you have that pizzicato line in the harp. You, I kept the celeste arpeggi, arpeggiations the same. And I put, in order to um, kind of get at what John's talking about, um, that solo was split between a violin and a cello, but obviously similar timbres, right? So I went with a bassoon and an English horn, both double reed instruments, to try and keep the timbres similar enough, yet have their own individual quality. This is what it wound up sounding like. And that was really, I thought, the closest that we could get to replicating that sound world in a wind ensemble. Right? Obviously, maybe it's still not as effective as it is in the orchestra, um, but we tried our best to, to make it like that. Now, those are just two examples, the horn uh, octave example and this example here. Just two examples of what was um, a 10 minute piece where there was not one page of the score that didn't have issues similar to, similar to this that we had to run into and navigate. That's why that revision process is so important. right? Because this was not originally what I had. I had to go through with several versions to get um, what, an idea of voicing and orchestration that would work well. And that's why that revision process was so important. So I, I want to leave some time for questions, but I, I also want to play some of her music. Um, like, you know, like I said, I transcribed those two pieces of a spring morning and uh, of a sad evening. And I think they're both wonderful pieces. Um, they both deserve to be played. They both deserve to be uh, in our canon, whether you're playing in an orchestra or in a band. Students should know who Lily Boulanger is and have the, the chance to play her music. Audiences should have the chance to hear her music. But um, over that period of time working on these projects, I became especially um, engaged with this piece of a sad afternoon. Now, I think it really provides us a window into Lily Boulanger's soul and into her, her humanity. She finished this just months before she died. She knew that she was dying. And for me, this piece is very much a confrontation of that knowledge, that knowledge of her own uh, mortality, her terminal illness. And I think it has a lot to say. So I, I want to play for you the end of, of a sad evening because I think it's pretty powerful uh, and it's a bit of a downer to end on, but it really does mirror the tragedy of her life um, and I think it speaks to the power and the emotional quality of her music, uh, which is substantial in my opinion. So this is the orchestral version. Um, uh, this is just the end of, uh, of a sad evening.
he's powerful, isn't he? You know, you can hear the anguish, the sadness, the anger um, that she's dealing with as she's coming to grips with the fact that she's not going to be alive for much longer um, at only 24 years old. A and I would like to point out, too, how different does this sound than Faust and Helen, right? The piece that won her that uh, Prix de Rome. So different. And for her to have had that range as a composer over the course of only um, a handful of years is stunning to me. And it really just piques the imagination. You're like, wh what could she have done? What, what would have been possible if she had lived a full life? What music would we have had um, from her that we don't have right now? So I, I really hope that this has piqued your interest in her music. Um, I know you have a couple of minutes for questions, but nothing would make me happier than hearing that you went home and, and just pulled up on Spotify anything by Lily Boulanger and, and listened to it because I, I think her music is really, really powerful um, and deserves a place in our canon um, as, a, as you know, guardians of the classical music and, and deciding what gets performed and um, what music we listen to and, and what we play over and over again. I think this has a seat at the table for sure. I think it's wonderful music. So uh, these are some uh, references um, and just great places to start if you want to learn more about Lily Boulanger. That article by Anna Gret Fauser in particular is really, really interesting. It talks a lot about um, some of the uh, gender obstacles that women had to overcome um, just to be uh, able to have some of the same uh, rights that men did in French uh, musical society. Uh, and that's very, very interesting. That CD there at the bottom, um, all of the orchestral excerpts today were pulled from that CD. It's a, it's a really, really fine album and representation of some of her large ensemble music, if you're interested in that. We have about seven minutes. Does anyone have any questions? I was just curious about the, the percussion concept at the end of that last part that you played. It sounded like there was just going to be this going crazy accoutre type thing. Yeah, it's a timpani part that actually is not in the score, believe it or not. So the at, the, um, at that spot, that big cadence, um, the double basses are playing this uh, 16th note triplet right at the end of the bar that would be a pickup into the next bar. Um, and someone decided, uh, I guess when they were recording this, to have the timpanis play that as well, but to omit the downbeat of the next bar. So you get this cliffhanger feel. Beam, dee dee, shum, da ka da. And then no downbeat. And it's not in the score. I mean, it's in the bass part, but it's not in the timpani part. And it sounds awesome, right? It gives this great dramatic effect. So we put it in the band version, just because we liked how it sounded. Um, but yeah, no, and, and you know, that really uh, brings up a larger uh, point. You know, the expanded percussion of a wind ensemble, of a modern wind ensemble, is obviously much more than what um, Lily was working with at the time that she was writing. So a lot of the string um, music that needs to be delicate or soft, uh, voicing that in the mallet percussion is a really, really effective technique, because mallets can play very soft um, when they need to. So yeah, I leaned very heavily on the percussion section in both of these transcriptions. Yeah. Okay. What, what did you use uh, Sibelius. I used yeah, I used Sibelius. Yeah. Other questions about the transcriptions or about Lily herself? I would love to. Yeah, I, I I think it's definitely on my docket for next year. I'm mulling over some different program ideas. I love this music. I think it's powerful music, um, and uh, absolutely looking to put these on some programs in the coming years. I think. I mean, if if y'all would enjoy it, that is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Catherine, I saw your hand was up. So she didn't write a lot for orchestra. Her other large orchestral works would be the cantata, Faust and Helen, that I played. Um, and she also has um, some very short works for like a brass choir, um, organ, and a vocal choir. Uh, but her instrumental, large instrumental output is, is fairly small. Most of the music that she wrote in her life was uh, vocal music or chamber music. Yeah. And, and by, the, by the way, check that stuff out. It's amazing, amazing, amazing writing. She's so, so talented at writing for different numbers of people, different instruments, different voices. Other questions? Okay, well that's all I have. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Lily Boulanger and her music. And uh, like I said, nothing would make me happier than to know you went home and, and um, 
took it upon yourself to just learn a little bit more about her or her music. Um, it's music that deserves to be played. It's music that has not been played. Um, this piece of A Sad Afternoon wasn't uh, premiered uh, by an orchestra until the 1970s, and it's been very performed uh, very infrequently since that point. Um, so it's music that's not played a lot, and it's music that I think should be played a lot, um, certainly much more than it is. So uh, if you have any questions at any point, um, you all can find me in, in my office, Roberts 203B, or just shoot me an email. Happy to talk with you at any point about Lily Boulanger. So thank you very much, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your Thursdays. <laughs>